Hi. Uh, okay. So I'm going to tell you about a bunch of results we have about this thing called the conditional disclosure of secrets. I'm going to start by telling you what it is. So this is the setting we have. So you have this function f on this predicate f on uh, two inputs. It's, it's public. Everyone knows this. And you have three parties. Alice, who knows x, one of the inputs to f. Bob, who knows y. And Carol, who knows both x and y. In addition, Alice and Bob have some shared randomness and a secret s. And for now, think of the secret as a single bit, right? A single bit secret s and this randomness. And they each compute one message based on whatever they know and send it to Carol. This is all that happens. And their objective is, uh, is to do two things. First, if the predicate f evaluates to one on their inputs, on, the, on x and y, then they're supposed to reveal the secret to Carol. Carol is supposed to be able to recover the secret given just the messages and x and y. On the other hand, if uh, the predicate is zero on x and y, then they want to hide the secret from Carol. And we formalized this by saying that you can simulate the distribution of the messages without knowing the secret. So if, if you can simulate it without knowing the secret, that means it can't have some much information about the secret, right? So, so they want to do these two things. They want to reveal the secret to Carol if and only if the function evaluates to one on the, on the inputs. The, so each, each of them knows one part of the input. And, uh, yeah. So they want to do this while minimizing the amount of communication they undertake. So this is a measure of complexity in this model. You want to minimize the amount of total amount of communication that uh, that happens in the protocol. Uh, so th yeah, so this is the this is the model. This is the so so you, what we want to do is we want to study the complexity of different functions in this model, uh, the the communication you need to realize different predicates. Uh, and uh, oh yeah, so and sometimes we'll also concern ourselves with the amount of randomness used, but but the main measure of complexity is the amount of communication, right? So this is the this is the conditional disclosure of secrets. And why do we want to study this? Uh, it turns out it's related to a lot of different things. I won't really have time to go into too many of these things. But perhaps the, prime, the one of primary importance is its relationship with uh, attribute-based encryption. It has, um, it, it by itself, it's a, it's a very simplified version of attribute-based encryption that gives you like a single-time security. But there are, there are, there's more to that, uh, but I won't have time to go into this. The, the, the application that I am most interested in is the, the last one. In, in a sense, this is a very, uh, 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 a very simplified model of a certain functionality in multi-party computation. Right? And, and if you want to prove things about multi-party computation in general, if you want to prove bounds, if you want to prove communication bounds, then it, uh, it's worthwhile to study the simpler model first, and maybe you can develop tools that work here and then scale them up to full fledged multi-party computation, right? Uh, so, so these are reasons to study this <laughs> conditional disclosure of secrets. Uh, and let, me, let me tell you a little bit about what we know so far, and, and, uh, broadly. So the, uh, uh, the, 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 the best general upper bound we know for any predicate is, uh, is due to Leo, Vaikunathan, and V, and you'll, you'll hear about this in 20 minutes time or so, uh, where they show that you can, for any predicate F, you can do CDS for it, with something like two to the square root and communication. Okay, so actually note that it's not even clear that you can do this for every predicate. If you, it's, it's not trivial to, to do it for any predicate, uh, but it turns out that you can actually do it and you can't do it with this much, this many bits of communication. Uh, and, uh, and if your predicate has certain other properties, like if it, if it is computable very efficiently in these models, in branching with branching programs or span programs, then you can do it much faster than this. Uh, so this is, these are the, these are the, must upper bounds we know. And in terms of lower bounds, we know ex uh, examples of predicates that require log n bits of communication. Predicates on n bit inputs that require log n bits of communication. This is due to Gay et al. And, and who, they also showed that, uh, and these are all simple predicates. These are like the inner product predicate or something like this. And they also showed that these predicates have, if you, if you look at this uh, specific kind of CDS called linear CDS, which means that the reconstruction function that Carol runs is linear in the messages. And, it's, it's, and this, this particular restriction is significant because this has a strong uh, connections with attribute-based encryption. Right? They showed that in this particular restricted version of CDS, the, th the same predicate, the inner product predicate, for example, has like a square root and at least square root and bits of communication complexity. Uh, yeah, so broadly, this is what, is what, uh, what we know from before. 
uh, in the rest of my talk, I'll be telling you some the results we have. We have a collection of results about different aspects of CDS, uh, about uh, different transformations you can do to CDS and, and some lower bones and everything. I, I won't be able to go into all of these in detail, but I will. Uh, I will tell you about one of these in detail, and, I'll, and I will uh, try to give you some idea of how the others come about. But before I do any of this, uh, I want to present a slightly different view of this problem, slightly different view of CDS, uh, a view that will that actually helped us arrive at many of the results that we have, and will will uh, and will make sense. You'll see. So, what I want to do is this. So, this is the this is the diagram from earlier, right? The the, the parties and the randomness and the everything. And I want to show how this model relates to the the statistical difference problem. I, I'll tell you what that is shortly. So, so you have this, you have these guys, and I want to concentrate on the distribution of the messages. So fix the x and y for now. Fix the inputs x and y. Now, depending on the secret, whether the secret is zero or one, you have different distributions for the messages, right? So the, you have this randomness r. And you're sampling that uniformly at random, and based on that, you get these distributions over the messages. What I want to do is I want to state the properties of uh, CDS, the properties that are required of this protocol in terms of properties of these distributions. What do I mean? For example, take the correctness property, right? It says that uh, if the function is one, then you should be able to recover the secret. And this you can see, uh, and uh, this I want to say is the same as saying that if you take an input x, y, which, uh, at which the predicate evaluates to one, then these two distributions over the messages in the two cases where, where, when the secret is zero and the secret is one are far, right? Because uh, well, if you can retrieve the secret, that means they have to be far because if they were close, then you can't retrieve the secret. And, and you can see that the other way around also holds with some laws, but this is roughly true. And, and similarly, if if uh, the privacy, in the privacy case, if your function value is zero, then uh, then the then by the simple triangle inequality, you can see that the fact that this the simulated distribution exists implies that the two distributions are close. Right. So, so what is this saying? This is saying that any CDS protocol for for this predicate f gives you this way to sample these distributions. In, and these distributions are sampled in a specific manner, right? So they have these two parts, this MA and MB. And MB, MA is sampled knowing just X, and MB is sampled knowing just Y. So, there, so these are these distributions which can be sampled in this decomposable manner. So, so a CDS protocol for a predicate F associates with each input X, Y, this, uh, this pair of decomposably sampleable distributions with the property that if F of X, Y is one, then these distributions are far. And if f of x, y is zero, then these distributions are close, right? And the, now I can talk about the statistical difference problem. The statistical difference problem is the same thing, where instead of saying decomposably sampleable distributions, you say efficiently sampleable distributions. You have like short, small circuits which can sample these distributions. And this problem has been studied extensively in the past because, uh, and one of the reasons being that this problem is complete for the class of problems which have statistical zero knowledge proofs, and and this. Uh, and, 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 and this connection, this connection to the statistical difference problem that CDS has, enables us to use a number of techniques that were developed for the statistical difference problem in the study of statistical zero knowledge proofs to prove results about CDS, to prove results about the communication complexity of CDS. Right? Uh, so yeah, so this is this is the point of view I want to take that, that CDS is somehow like statistical zero knowledge and it relates in this manner to the statistical difference problem. Right? So okay, so let, let me give an example of uh, how this point, this point of view, could help us do things, right? So let me state our first result, which is this. So uh, we construct a function. We call it p call. We'll I'll, I'll explain why it's called that soon. Uh, it's it's slightly unbalanced in the size of the inputs, but don't don't care about that. Uh, so this this predicate p call, for which there is a very efficient CDS protocol. Of uh, like this takes log n bits, but uh, this function has very high communication complexity, very high Yao communication complexity, right? and also has very high linear CDS complexity, uh, which follows from the previous one actually by by the, some work by Gay et al. And 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 this, as, as I will describe sh shortly, the construction of this problem uh, is inspired by actually uses problems that were used to show article separations between statistical zero knowledge and some other classes and BBP or, or even some larger classes. Uh, uh, 
and uh, and and uh, so so you basically showing all the separations comes down to showing query bounds, query complexity bounds, and then you use certain techniques to lift these query complexity bounds to the communication complexity setting, which is what the pattern matrix method comes in. And yeah, so uh, I'm going to tell you what this function is. I'm going to tell you what this function is, and and uh, and very briefly how this separation comes about, right? Uh, just to give you an idea of how the statistical different things comes in. Uh, so, okay, so I'm going to tell you what this function is, but to do that I have to introduce a different function first uh, called the collision problem. So the collision problem is defined on Boolean strings of length n log n, take the strings of length n log n, uh, and divide it up, you start by dividing it up into blocks of size log n, so n blocks of size log n each, and you take the function hz, so this, this string is z, you take the function hz, which is given, whose truth table is given by z, right? So uh, it's a function on log n bits, and each of those blocks, and it's, it's this multi-bit function of, uh, which has log n bits of output, and z is the truth table of this function, like hz of i is just the ith block in that. You take this log n bit string as a number from one to one, and take the ith block. So, and uh, the collision function is defined as follows. It's a promise problem, which asks, is this function that is defined by the z, is it one to one, or is it two to one? Right? This is the problem, so this is the problem. Uh, and uh, this is a, this problem was used by Aronson to show these oracle separations bit, bit from SSK, between SSK and other classes. Uh, and why was this function used? Well, uh, it is because of the following implication of the of the properties you have in the zero and one cases, right? So, if you have if the collision function is zero, if the function happens if your H Z happens to be a one to one function, then that implies that you take all the blocks over there, right? you take all the blocks in Z then all of the, all possible values of these blocks occurs exactly once, right? So if you take a random block and look at, look at its value, this value will be uniformly distributed over zero, one to the log n. On the other hand, if, uh, if hz is two to one, then half of the possible values of the blocks don't even occur in z. So if you take a random uh, block and look at its value, the distribution of this value will be very far from uniform. And this sort of, uh, uh, so, so in one case, you are saying the dis uniform distribution and this ran distribution of a random block uh, are close, are the same, in fact. And in the other case, you are saying they're far, right? And this sort of property is where, uh, is how it relates to the statistical zero knowledge problems. And this is why it's useful in these cases. But, but yeah, so, so this, is the, this is what you have to remember, that if the collision function is zero, then this random block is uniformly distributed. If it is one, then it's far from uniformly distributed, right? So this is the collision function. And uh, now I'm going to define the p-call function. By, by taking this input, so the, the collision function takes this one string as input, right? But I want, I want two strings because I want this, in our model there are two inputs to the function, so I want to split this input into two parts, and I'm going to do it in a certain manner. So, so our function p call will be defined as uh, uh, the collision function applied to this operator, so it takes this x and y as input, and we are going to do a certain operation that I will describe now. And we're we are just going to apply the collision function to, to this, this string that comes out of this operation, right? So what is this operation? It's, uh, so you have these two, two inputs, x and y. x is of length 4n times log n, right? Uh, you start by dividing it into small chunks of size 4. You have this n log n chunks of size 4. And y, if you remember, was of length 2n log n. Uh, and what you do is you divide it into chunks of size 2 and interpret these two bits as numbers between 1 and 4. So you have, again, you have n log n uh, chunks like this, and you, and you line these up, and you use y, the entries of y, as pointers into x, right? So this, you take the, in the first chunk, you take the third bit, the second bit, and so on, and you construct this, this n log n bit string, right? So this is, uh, I will call this the, the indexing operation. This is x indexed by y. And the function we have is simply, so this p call takes x and y as input, and applies the collision problem, the, the collision function, to x indexed by y, right? So, so now I have these two inputs, right? I have, earlier I had one input, which was just this. Now I have these two inputs. I will be giving one of these to Alice and the other to Bob. Uh, uh, now, why, why did we do this in this peculiar manner? Because it turns out that if you break up functions in this manner, you can, we know how to show communication complexity lower bounds. Uh, so, so this basically works as follows. So, Ambarinus and Kutin showed the, a lower bound for what is called the approximate degree of the collision function, and then Shostow showed how you can lift that, 
lift a lower bound on the, this collision function, on the approximate degree of the collision function to a lower bound on the randomized communication complexity of the peak call function if it is constructed in this manner. Uh, and this is why we are splitting it up in this way. And the reason we chose the collision function was because it has the statistical zero knowledge uh, uh, algorithms that we'll use later. Oh, and, and yeah, so this shows this randomized com communication complexity lower bound. And, and uh, Gay et al. showed that this, in fact, implies a lower bound on the linear CDS complexity. And so this is the lower bound part of it. Uh, and, 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 and next, I'll, I'll show you how what uh, I'll briefly describe a CDS protocol for for this peak call function that is very efficient, that is not linear, and is much more and, is, and, is, and uses like logarithmic amount of communication, uh, which is this. So okay, so this is what you have to do, right? So you have uh, you have Alice and Bob. Alice has x, Bob has y. And these two implicitly define this, this x indexed by y string. And, and uh, the, when we are concerned about the collision function applied to the string. And that involves breaking this up into blocks of size log n and, and asking, and remember, so if, if the collision function was zero, that means that a random block is uniformly distributed. And if it is one, a random block is far from uniformly distributed, right? So what we are going to do is Alice and Bob are going to pick a random i, that is to pick a random block. So there are n blocks, they're going to pick a random block, and they are somehow going to securely communicate the value of that block to curl. Right? And it, you can do this using what are called private statement and messages protocols that I won't have time to talk about now. But basically this is what they do. So they have, they choose a random block here, and they securely communicate the value of that block to curl if the secret is zero. Right? And if the secret is one, they communicate a completely random string of length log n. Right? Now, if, uh, if the value of our function was zero, then we said that a random block is uniformly distributed. Right? So, in, so in both cases, Carol will see the same distribution. But if the value of the function is one, then uh, a random block's value is far from uniform. So in the case s equals zero, this distribution will be far from uniform, and in this case, it will be exactly uniform. So they'll be far. So, so in the case where P call is zero, you, you get these two distributions, two decomposably sample width distributions, which are, which are exactly the same in this case. And uh, in the case the P call is one, these are far apart. So that gives you correctness. And, uh, yeah, so, and, and, and uh, so this, this again shows you uh, 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 the, the, the usefulness of considering this, this equivalence between, C, uh, between CDS and statistical zero knowledge, right? Because that's where we got the collision function from. We, we chose it because it has this nice statistical zero knowledge sish algorithm, and then we were able to translate it to this setting using this PSM as a tool in between. Uh, yeah, so this is about the separation. And uh, so in the time I have left, I'm going to quickly describe the other results we have, and maybe tell, maybe say a couple of sentences or each of those. Uh, so the next thing we can show is that the complexity of CDS is closed under composition with Boolean formulas. What do I mean? I mean, you can take, uh, let's say you have predicates F1 to Fm, which have communication, which are CDS protocols with communication complexity T1 to Tm and randomness complexity Rho1 and Rho M. Then we show how to construct a CDS protocol for uh, a Boolean formula H composed with all these predicates, which has communication complexity and randomness complexity that are polynomial in the, in the in the respective in the complexities over here, and it's, and it's linear in the size of the Boolean formula, and this again follows from this again you can the construction follows from using the similar transformations that were that were shown for the statistical difference problem by Saha and Vadan, and along with uh, these PSM protocols you, uh, that, that I mentioned earlier. And again, this follows from looking at this uh, equivalence between CDS and statistical zero knowledge. The, the, and the next thing is uh, amplification. So we show how you can take a C uh, CDS protocol with certain parameters, which has uh, this a constant privacy and correctness errors, and works for a single bit secret, and transform it to a CDS for the same predicate with longer secrets and much smaller correctness and privacy errors at the cost of a linear overhead in the communication. So you, you, the, linear, the communication is multiplied by k, and this becomes like two to the minus k. Uh, so so uh, a certain version of this, again, follows from what is called the polarization lemma, which is, which is another transformation for the statistical difference problem. 
but it turns out that under these settings of parameters, you can get something better using like, RAM secret sharing schemes. Uh, uh, so these three followed from uh, looking at uh, the connections with statistical zero knowledge, right? And the, the others uh, are somewhat different. Uh, the next thing we can show is, uh, is uh, non-explicit lower bound for CTS. So, like I said earlier, the, the previous known lower bound was, uh, was that there was an explicit function that, that people showed, that Gay et al. showed that it requires log n bits of communication. What we can show is a non-explicit function. We don't, we don't know what function it is, but we can show that there exists a function by some counting arguments uh, that requires some linear amount of communication complexity, linear number of bits of communication. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is uh, we basically it's shown by reducing to some existing lower bounds for the private simultaneous messages thing that I mentioned earlier again due to Feige Killian and our uh, yeah this is we show this lower bound and the last thing is uh, an amortization theorem where we say that if you have one predicate and a very long secret, very very long secret then we show how to construct a CDS protocol for this predicate and this secret, uh, where the number of bits of communication per secret bit is n, right? So if you took the best known protocol and repeated it uh, independently for each bit, this would be the amount of the communication you would, uh, you would incur. But if, if your secret is long enough, then you can do it much better than that. Um, yeah, so this, 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 is, this, is, uh, this is what we have. We have this, this collection of results about different aspects of the conditional disclosure of secrets. And, uh, and yeah, so the things I wanted to highlight here are these connections that this seems to have with the statistical difference problem and, 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 and things that we can do with that. Uh, and there are, there are, of course, questions about whether you can do similar things with other models, right? like, we, like the private, private simultaneous messages model I was talking about, which I did not quite describe. Uh, does that have connections to something else which you can exploit in a similar manner? And, uh, uh, and, and also the best known techniques to lower bound this PSM, already lower bound CDS, that's, that's what we did. Like we reduced the lower bounding CDS to lower bounding this PSM. Whereas it's believed that PSM can be much more expensive than CDS. So this says that if you want to get lower bounds on, on this model, you need, you need new techniques, maybe. Um, uh, but yeah, so yeah, this is what we have. And there are avenues for improving all of, almost all of these that, uh, that, that, that I hope people do. Yeah, thanks, yeah, that's what I had to say. <laughs>